All right, hi guys, welcome to our first panel discussion uh, by CDI College. We're super happy to have you here and we are going to be discuss discussing um, the mental health of our Canadian community. So let's begin with some introductions. My name is Lavanya Hiramath. I work in community relations at CDI College. Uh, I love the topic of mental health. I'm super passionate about it. I think we all have our own stories with it. And uh, I am really excited to talk about it. Adele. Oh, sorry. Hi, my name is Adele. Um, I'm, an, I'm a filmmaker. Um, and a lot of my focus is around intergenerational trauma um, and trying to uh, look at the roots of how sectarian conflict um, you know, affects identity. Um, and so a lot of my work is just really around trying to um, reshape the narrative around trauma. It's amazing. I've seen a little bit of your work and it's really quite stunning. Thank you so much. Dakota? Hello everyone. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. So my name is Dakota Douglas. I am the crisis team lead at Distress Centre Calgary. So my role essentially is to supervise our full-time contact centre coordinators. And those are the folks who uh, supervise our volunteers who answer our crisis line. So a big part of my job is uh, figuring out procedures, policies, and how to get those procedure policies and trainings to our frontline staff. Um, and a lot of my job is supporting in debriefs and conversations after they've had high risk contacts um, or just difficult frontline shifts. So I have been with the stress center for just over three years and I have done four different positions. So everywhere from practicum student to crisis line worker uh, to one of the contact center supervisors. And now I am the crisis team lead. So that's a little bit about me. Uh, mental health definitely means a lot to me and it is what I do full-time 40 hours a week. That's pretty incredible and the Distress Center serves a lot of people from what I can understand. Really great community stuff. Rianne? Hi, uh, my name is Rianne White. Uh, I was a campus director at CDI College for about five years. Um, and I uh, had some amazing students that inspired me to go back to uh, get my master's of psychology. Um, so I, Dakota is one of those amazing students. Um, and I, then I decided to uh, present a mental health initiative uh, here in Southern Alberta. So we did some capacity building. So we developed a mental health Mondays for students, a mental health orientation that takes about 45 minutes for students to understand um, you know, what they're going into with school and probably what brought them to school. Um, and I, yeah, I've counseled for a bit at the Calgary Counseling Center during my internship, which was an amazing experience. And I, I have uh, now returned back to being a campus director at one of our sister schools. So uh, definitely uh, mental health is one of my passions and, uh, you know, helping the students with their mental health is uh, one of my, my things that make me come to work every day. So. We're so excited to have you. And I think a lot of this was inspired by your work. So thank you for that. Thank you. All right, let's do a quick icebreaker. So what does everyone like to do that's completely outside of their work? Anything. I like, I started like playing around making beats. Uh, so I got like a, it's called a, it's called a controller. So you just yeah. go and start to manipulate sounds. So I've been really like experimenting with, with uh, sounds, which is like not really That's a so part cool. of my Is that but like in the DJ area or? Producing a little bit. Um, I'm not really there to call myself a producer yet. Like I'm just, yeah. I just like, something like outside of my, because my whole like work is creative. Um, yeah. So I try to find other creative outlets that are not really related to my work just to keep myself on my toes, I guess, or keep learning. So I'm always learning. Um, so yeah, that's what I'm doing. Super fun. Anyone else? I I'm a big uh, water person, so whenever I can get out on my kayak, I definitely do that. Uh, so yeah, yes. just anything in nature makes me happy. Yeah, I'm with you. <laughs> I love that. 
Um, myself, I like to go for long walks. Um, so I like to go for walks where I know nothing's going to attack me, like uh, bears or coyotes. <laughs> so I like to go to the forested area in Glenmore because um, it's a little bit of, of country, but a little bit of city safety. <laughs> Right. Yeah. I actually recently downloaded an app that tells me what plants names are and bird calls. Oh, nice. So that's really fun to do. And I'm in the city, so <laughs> the most nature I get. Great. Okay. So let's dive right into this. Um, before we do that, I want to set some, you know, set the tone for this meeting, talk about the ground rules. I think it's really important for us to respect each other and understand that mental health is very personal to each person. A lot of people might have different experiences and triggers associated with that. So we're all going to respect your boundaries um, and, and address each other the way that we want to be addressed and, um, and just do this in a very positive and safe way. All right, so let's go around and um, talk about the definition for mental health. So the Canadian uh, definition is essentially the well, your psychological and emotional well-being. Um, but I know that a lot of our audience might have like um, certain notions about what mental health means. They might uh, really not understand how to take care of their mental health or maybe think it doesn't apply to them. And then other people have a very detailed understanding. So let's talk about definitions a little bit. you guys have any thoughts on what mental health means to you and how you would define it? I guess I could go first. Um, so I, for me, mental health means uh, understanding the human as a whole. I think a lot of us uh, deal with a lot of labels throughout our lives and just the basic human experience, you know, going back to basics, um, you know, understanding like a CBD, therapy uh, basically just talks about going back to understanding the moment and why something uh, has happened. And I think that a lot of us forget to do that. And a lot of our supports have kind of fallen away over the years where we take that moment of reflection. I know that, uh, you know, churches in the past used to be a moment to reflect, uh, well, an hour to reflect on a Sunday. Um, and with the, uh, you know, people moving away from churches and moving away, we need to have that still have those conversations about what makes us, uh, you know, as individuals uh, become healthier and take time for ourselves. And, uh, you know, I think that it's great in the last two years, uh, you know, of all the things that COVID did uh, that were scary, I think the best thing that it ever did was propel us into the understanding that mental health is so important and so much stuff was happening before COVID um, that now it's uh, the safeties and supports are starting to be there for people. And I know that uh, being in a work environment, um, you know, we've been talking a lot more about mental health than we ever were before. It used to be like, leave that stuff at the door, um, which has never been my personal philosophy, um, because I feel like if people are leaving it at the door, they're not presenting their true self at work and they're using some of their energy uh, in order to mask things because they're ashamed, right? And we don't want anyone to feel shame. Uh, to me, it's a, a waste of energy. So uh, how do we move on, right? So yeah, so that's the long answer for me. No, that's absolutely true. It can be so damaging to ignore it completely and, and deny the fact that we all have our own mental state. Dakota, you look like you were going to say something. What's your definition? Yeah, I think uh, similar, right? I think one thing when I hear mental health, I think a lot of folks think that like only a specific person can struggle with mental health, not realizing that every single person as an individual has mental wellness, which can impact mental health, right? So mm -hmm. I, I think people forget that that mental health, mental illness, it doesn't discriminate regardless of what backgrounds you come from, what you've been through, um, or what you're going to go through. Every single one of us at one point in our life, life can can struggle with with mental health. Um, and that, you know, it's it's quite normal, right? It's more common than folks actually understand. And I think that's because of how heavily stigmatized 
stigmatized mental health is in our society, right? We just don't talk about it enough, uh, where a lot of folks might think that only a certain people can, can struggle, and, and that's not the case, right? If you if you are born with a brain, which we all are, you have potential to to struggle with that mental health. And I think it's important for us to all realize and, and to be there for one another and to create safe spaces like this one to talk about those things. Wow. I think the way that I would define mental health is kind of like your overall well-being um, as a result of the results of the experiences that you've been through. Um, since a lot of my work is around trauma, um, I think you realize that when you acknowledge that there are certain, that certain events affect your life um, and they kind of have like long lasting effects on you. Um, so when you talk about uh, mental health, uh, there's a lot of facets that come into it, but just kind of understanding how experiences affect people and then how we like recover from those experiences to then go on and be able to live quote unquote normal lives, you know, um, because there, there is such a thing as like being mentally okay and, it's, and having like, like some mental health issues. But then there's also like the full blown issues of um, traumatic experiences that like stop you from experiencing life. Again, quote unquote, um, as someone who hasn't been traumatized. Um, so I think when we define mental health, I think it's important that we look at our experiences. We look at all of the things that make up that brain, you know, um, and all the memories and experiences and the DNA and everything. Um, and then how that, in fact, you know, affects the way that we uh, relate to the rest of the world. Um, so yeah, for me, mental health is just about, about creating understanding. Absolutely. That's such a great segue into my next question, which was going to ask you about that, which is, what's the difference between mental health and mental impairment? Um, how do you tell? And is it just a switch or is it like a spectrum? Um, sorry, like, can you repeat your question one more time? I just need to... Yeah, sure, yeah. So you talked about mental health, and then there's mental impairment or mental illness, right? And what's the difference between those two? How can we tell? Like, what do you um, think? I think, like, mental health is a strategy, you know? Mental health is, like, just, like, an overall umbrella that covers, like, oh, how to take care of yourself, uh, c community, conversations. It's, con it's like... It's more of an action word versus uh, like trauma is an experience, is, pers is very personal um, and it affects the way that you're able to navigate the world. Um, and so like mental health, like there's like PTSD, trauma, like there's also psychotic disorders. There's, a, it's like, there's so much that goes into the umbrella of what is considered an impairment for mental health. Um, and so I think, yeah, that's what separates them is the one is more about the conversations you have around it more about the community and like just the overall umbrella that covers uh, the spectrum of like how to get better um, versus the impairment is an actual day-to-day -day struggle that comes from certain experiences. Um, and then those experiences in turn affect the way that you um, are able to navigate in the world. It, it, maybe it affects your relationships um, or it affects the way you're able to carry out a job um, or, you know, it's, there's just, uh, some things that we, that some people maybe have not learned or haven't created a, a, a type of understanding around. Um, and so it impairs the way that you're able to function in society. Um, and so that would be my definition of how those two are separate. Okay. Interesting. Does anyone else want to weigh in on that? Yeah, for sure. So um, definitely a lot of, a lot of similar thoughts, I think, as, as Adele. Um, but for me, mental health is something that we all have, right? It's something that we we all have to be conscious of and, and considerate of. Um, I would really challenge the word impairment, uh, mainly mm -hmm. just because like, is it an impairment because of how society creates accessibility in our world for folks who live with mental illness? Um, and I only say that because, yeah, I, th I think there's potential for any one of us to struggle with mental illness and, and it can come on, you know, and there, there are definitely factors into that, right? Like Adele was speaking about, you know, traumatic experiences can definitely factor in. Um, but I think the difference is, is based on diagnosis, right? Someone who mm -hmm. lives with mental illness would, would go 
somewhere where they can seek treatment for that diagnosis, right? Where mental health is something that we we all live with and we all have to be, you know, conscious and considerate of where, you know, a mental a mental illness or, or something that someone has to live day by day is is something that needs treatment or something that um you know society is not meant right there are so many folks who live with i can name several you know disorders that folks aren't able to work with and and is that because of of how society views these illnesses and what they expect to be a norm in their in their employees i hope i'm not rambling and i hope i'm making sense but i th i think the difference is that society is not built for people who are living with mental illness to the point that those people can't get jobs, they can't get work, they can't have meaningful re relationships uh, because of how negatively our society has looked at mental health for for so long. Um, so I don't think the difference is huge. I think that one demographic significantly is has less accessibility to the workforce and and basically basic needs to life uh, because of, of illnesses that they've been diagnosed with. That's kind of where my thought process is. Wow, that's actually really revolutionary for me to hear because uh, I think you're right. I think there's a lot of stigma around it. And then if, if somebody is open about their struggles, they risk being labeled uh, and then shunned. So I think that's really that's a really great point to bring up. Yeah, and I agree. Like, you know, the word impairment is, is one that uh, kind of brings up ideas about like the thing with impairment uh, when people are impaired because of alcohol. Um, you know, they're sometimes not aware how much they're impaired and mental health is the same way. Uh, sometimes it's the way people are reacting to people that make people aware that they're uh, struggling with something. Um, because if people are constantly adapting to you, um, there's no reason for you to change. So I know that, uh, you know, that's always the conversation um, is, are people aware? I mean, you know, people who are in domestic abuse situations, a lot of the time aren't aware. It's kind of like a, a boiling pot, right? That you get a little bit and then a little bit more and a little bit more. Um, and same with trauma, right? Um, you know, when you've been traumatized, it's like, the brain um, and uh, Dakota can explain this a little bit better, probably because of the life saving uh, background. Um, but you know, if you if you're thrown into cold water, your extensions in your body, your arms and your legs stop getting blood pumped to them because it's going to your core. And that's the same thing with trauma is uh, the brain stops being able to learn as well, which is, uh, you know, one thing that we're really becoming trauma informed with our students is, is it that this student really has a learning disability or some other thing that wasn't diagnosed before? Or is it that the student is dealing with some trauma at home? at home right um and is unable to memorize and learn and stay focused right so we want to make sure because this might be the last time that this student is going to uh extend themselves into this situation so we want to make sure that we're not re-traumatizing them and sending them out into the world and them not taking that step to come back to better their life in the future so um i think there's so many so many ways that we could uh you know uh, interpret that impairment uh statement right but uh, mental health is the whole body system. So it's even, um, you know, making sure you have nourishing foods. Um, I know myself uh, when I was going to school and working full time and I had 70 hours a week um, as a single mom, uh, I was making the meals ahead of time and grind grinding in the blender, uh, you know, the vegetables into the meat when I cooked the meat so that I didn't have to think about a vegetable with meat, right? Um, and for me, that was like a huge thing because I was so stressed out about it. So it's just little things, um, but really, if we we're talking about the big mental health uh, epidemic that's happening, no one's going to think about vegetables, right? So it's it's about bringing it down back to basics. That's, yeah, that's pretty incredible. I think it's very misunderstood in our society because if you look at the stats, um, it's completely underreported, underfunded. I think they say there's a suicide every 40 seconds. Um, in Canada, suicide is the leading cause of death for adolescents uh, up to middle age. Um, and they say 50% of people by age 40 have or will have experienced some kind of mental health issue. Um, so I guess what I got from all of you is that trauma is probably the tipping point or the driving um, force behind a lot of mental health issues. And so 
I think we need a lot more trauma-informed people in our spaces. Um, so what about, talk a little bit about the epidemic that you mentioned, Leanne. Um, you know, with even before the pandemic, I think uh, this has obviously been an issue and, and we don't have enough resources pretty much in any country globally to tackle it. And, and so let's talk about that problem a little bit. Yeah, so um, I, I guess uh, I prefer to talk about the solution rather than the problem, um, just because we've had the solutions in the past. And the solution is, um, I know that uh, on one of the TED Talks that I watched, and I apologize, I don't remember the name of the speaker, but they talked about that they traveled to Africa. And in Africa, um, they were talking about the cure for depression, and they already had the cure for depression. And so the guy said, awesome, like, show me what this, this uh, is. Is it herbs? Is it something? And he said, no, we sit with them. So when we know that someone is upset, uh, the men from the village sit next to the men, um, you know, until they feel better and just being in each other's space. Um, and that's something that we've forgotten is how important our village is, how important those connections are, um, you know, how important just having, uh, you know, well-prepared meals, having those supports. Um, I know that families used to live with each other for generations and as much as it was unpleasant at times um, it created a support for our seniors it created support for our children that they knew that there was more than just their parents um, and what we're doing as society now is putting too much pressure on individuals to be able to be everything to everyone um, and that is something that, first of all, um, excludes people from, from being able to, uh, you know, everyone in the world has their own special skill. Everyone has some amazing ability that uh, is kind of their superpower in, in one way or another, right? And so I think that we're really depriving the world of, of some skills by creating this uh, isolation. Um, you know, I think that uh, one of the things that we need to be working on is capacity building. So I here at the school, one of our uh, mental health programs is the Mental Health Awareness Award. So every student is encouraged to take, uh, you know, brain story certification, which we run on Thursday nights. Um, and, uh, you know, the trauma informed care modules through AHS that are free, um, you know, so we're actually training uh, students so that when they go and, and take the initiative, they can actually go out into the work world and be the productive employees that are helping people promote trauma-informed care. Because let's face it, um, a lot of us have been in schools and in, in uh, work environments that basically we get re-traumatized ourselves, even if our trauma isn't you know, newsworthy trauma, um, you know, someone saying something nasty to you uh, can traumatize you and, and make you not want to re-engage, right? So we want to make sure that we're, we're being, uh, you know, as a society, kinder to each other, more understanding. Um, but I think it's uh, a lot of people don't want to have the conversation about mental health because they think it's an excuse to get out of work when really it's a um, roadmap on how to work together and uh, activate people's strengths, right, is the way I look at it. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, from Adele's work, she uh, addresses a lot of the trauma that people have faced. And I think, what are the, uh, Adele, what are those what are those issues that you saw that you felt you need to address? Um, well, I saw, I think I, I, I grew up with someone with PTSD, um, someone who experienced like war and stuff. Um, and so I kind of grew up in a family that had experienced some trauma. Um, and it made me have to take, take a step back and observe and say, okay, like there's something wrong here. I can't really put my finger on it, but you know, I'm, I'm making some comparison. I don't, and I'm seeing it as an issue. And so, a lot of my work has been around addressing this issue and also its relationship to identity because the way that we carry ourselves out of the world is a kind of a reflection of our past. Um, and so a lot of my work is, I actually go into elementary schools um, and uh, I've been, I was working with the Burnaby School District um, and I've worked with the several universities as well, like SFU and I've done some, some different talks for the different departments. Um, and a lot of the times it's just kind of understanding um, Kind of like what is that, that what is that experience you know like understanding that sometimes the, the trauma that affects us is not really unnecessarily our own but sometimes we inherit it 
Um, and so as I've gone into elementary schools and I've started speaking with kids and let them understand that, you know, the relationship you have with the world begins first with yourself um, and kind of allowing them to have a sense of like, I call it, it's kind of an individuation, right? Like becoming an individual that's like outside of your experience um, and being able to uh, then learn how to navigate the world as yourself. Um, and so I've, I've noticed that a lot of the times it's that uh, some of the kids who come from traumatized families never have an opportunity to um, have the certain resources or have the language or the understanding um, to know that what is affecting them is not like, it's a, it's a product of history as well. Um, and so I've taken on the role of trying to educate people about sectarian conflict because that's very, very specific. Um, and, and the experiences that come from that um, and also with my current film right now, looking at um, the relationship of motherhood and, and, and trauma and war um, and how, you know, like the vessel that you're a mother, you, you carry the child in your stomach. So any of the experiences, any of the things that are going on in your environment are going to affect uh, your womb and, and the, the child that you're nurturing. Then you bring them out into the world. You are their first um, you, you are their first understanding of what relationships are with other human beings, right? You're, you, you raise them to become these people. And then from there, they take on that role to be themselves. And then they're trying to understand their relationship with their parents' experiences and themselves. Um, and so it's been a lot of uh, breaking it down and just kind of getting people to the understanding that you are yourself first, and then your experiences are a product of that and not to, and to just start to understand, to separate yourself um, and just start to dig at those degrees of separation. But a lot of the times, especially in the mental health uh, world, like especially like with therapists and things, sometimes it's really hard for um, people who have intergenerational trauma to get the proper diagnosis uh, because they also don't understand what is the things that are affecting them. Um, and so uh, I've kind of taken on to do more art-based therapy, um, storytelling, um, you know, conversations, and also kind of you know, you get catharsis from sharing your experiences, right? And you're able to purge your emotions by able to be, by being able to confront the things that you've gone through. Um, and so I just kind of uh, taken that position because I have that understanding of uh, being raised by, by trauma and also being affected by it. And, and then learning how to do some of my own healing um, outside of certain structures and systems. And so the experiences and things that I've learned have now, I've kind of tried to use them um, in the art-based way um, to try to get people to the same understanding um, that it's that you, you have to just start to like learn how to separate yourself and your experiences um, in order to relate to the world a little bit better. Um, but that's sort of the things that I found is um, the the more like root, deeply rooted traumas. Interesting. So so trauma can be inter intergenerational and not very easily identified. Yeah, and I think. The, the thing that Adele brought up that uh, really makes me think is whenever we're treating children, um, and I'm glad that you brought up the art-based therapy, because um, that made me think of two points. Whenever we're treating children, uh, when I was counseling, um, we knew that we were really counseling the child in order to access the parents, for the parents to understand that it's really they needed counseling also. Um, and so that's, uh, you know, something that a lot of people do. And I was one of them. I took my children after my divorce to a, a children of divorce group. And, uh, you know, when I went to drop off my children, they're like, and your room's over here. And I was like, but I, it's for my children. Children, right and I'm so glad it was such an amazing experience they used art-based therapy and it became fun and then you know just having those conversations you don't usually get uh, with your children right um, we also did like a weekend retreat for art therapy for me and my daughters and it was called a mother and daughter reconnection uh, weekend and it was one of the most amazing experiences and I think that people forget that mental health maintenance can actually be really fun. It can be stuff that we do, like all of us will go for a paint night with some wine, um, but we don't think to do it as an art therapy type of thing. We think about relaxing, but we don't think about learning about ourselves during, during these events. And I think that we have a lot of opportunities that we could do um, in order to do that. I love that. What about you, Dakota? What, um... You work in this field, so the issues that we know exist, I mean, you see the proof of it every day. Um, maybe tell the world that, you know, it does exist and it needs to be addressed. 
Oh, absolutely. I think, you know, I, I think the biggest thing that I would want people to understand is, is, you know, crisis really comes from a lack of basic need, right? I think a lot of folks think that, you know, these extreme things have to happen and in order for, for, you know, mental health or, or mental illness to manifest and, and really, that's not always the case, right? Um, it definitely can be. It's a huge, it's a huge factor. But I also think, you know, there are things that we could do to support our community in so many big ways. Um, as simple as as just donating some food, right? Because I think a lot of times when folks are in crisis and and they are struggling with their their mental health, um, it's because they're lacking things like food, shelter, water, clothing, uh, things that we wouldn't even think about having, right? Things that we take for granted every single day, um, and and just understanding, you know, what can we do to to get those supports to people, right? Whether it's doing our own donations, uh, you know, whether it's, you know, being more conscious of, of, you know, waste, right? I think, you know, I always think of like, oh, this last piece of bread, I never want it. And it's like, man, like, you know, there, there are so many folks who just need their basic needs met and they're not being met in Canada, right? This is, yeah, it's, it's heartbreaking. Um, and I, I think the other thing to add on uh, with mental health and, and crisis is that it, it can't be defined, right? We all walk through things very differently. And I think one thing that I've definitely taken out of working at a crisis center is that we can't define crisis, right? It's, it's one of our, our values. And one of the things we move forward with as an organization is that absolutely anyone can call us. Um, and I think it's important to realize that people walk through things differently, right? Um, so what someone may find, you know, traumatic or triggering, another person may not. Um, and, and that's okay, right? Which is why it's just important to leave that space and to be able to sit with people, right? Just to, to sit with them and, and to acknowledge that it's okay to struggle. Um, but I think at the end of the day, the biggest thing is community of care, right? If we want that mental health support, we have to have a community that cares to engage in, in providing these supports, whether it's basic needs um, or whether it's more in-depth mental health support, like providing more accessible DBT therapy or, or different types of therapies, right? Um, but I, I think that mental health really is a huge spectrum, right? It can be anywhere from lack of basic needs to, you know, uh, tons of adverse childhood experiences, right? I think, uh, Rian, I think you had chatted about brain stories. The most excellent course I have ever ever, ever completed. It is phenomenal. Um, and it really will speak to those adverse childhood experiences and, and how, how much that can shape and impact someone. Um, but it also talks about, you know, how folks who, who don't have those experiences can still grow up and struggle with addiction, right? These are things that are diseases that we can all live with. Um, so yeah, I'm sorry, I feel like I'm going on a little bit of a ramble here, uh, but it's so easy when it's like, you can go so many different ways with this topic, right? We can cover so many different things. Um, I thought it was funny when you were like, we probably won't take the whole hour. And I was like, oh, we're gonna take the whole hour. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's kind of, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I mean, the whole point of it is to kind of educate each other on, on the problem that exists so that we can find solutions. So I love that you're solutions-based, Rianne. I think we all really want and need these solutions. And like Dakota said, people shouldn't be struggling. You know, we live in a world abundant with resources. Maybe we're not uh, distributing them properly. Um, so definitely we need to look at some solutions. So having said that, uh, we went into the problems, but what about the pandemic? How do you guys think the pandemic affected mental health? I know everyone's expecting, uh, all the studies are showing that depression, anxiety is on the rise. People are under a tremendous amount of stress. Um, is there anything we should, that you're seeing in your, like in the university, in the Christ Center, or in the people that you work with, Adele, um, that is pandemic related? Oh yeah, for sure. Um I think this is a time where a lot of people uh, had to go into some types of isolation and, and had to be alone with themselves. So I've noticed that um, a lot of the people that I've met have actually taken the time more to focus on their mental health because um, now that things kind of move virtually and people are working from home, I think more people have had an opportunity to um, you know, structure their lives in a certain way. Some people lost their jobs 
And so people had to reevaluate themselves. And so I feel like this was a super reflective period for a lot of people. Um, and at first it might've been a little bit hard for, um, it was like, there's a lot of adversities at the beginning, but I feel like as we're transitioning out of the pandemic, um, a lot of people have come out with a sense of self and be like, I don't like, you know, I don't want to do this or that anymore. Or just the way that they're relating to the world is a little bit different or the way that they relate to their jobs. Um, and the things that they want, I feel like we've had an opportunity to have like the whole world stop for a moment. And we all had an opportunity to deeply reflect and be like, oh, all right. Like, you know, and, and a lot of things have changed as well. Like, um, the, or like the social justice narratives. Um, and like, you know, um, a lot, so we just had a, a really big opportunity for to have a reset. Um, and I feel that even though there's been a lot of issues because uh, people who've gone in isolation, like the alcohol and drugs consumption has definitely risen a lot more. Um, and we're seeing a lot of like addiction, um, you know, people who are in like, you know, relationships that turned abusive um, or, you know, relationships ending because of, you know, being confined in certain spaces. So there's been a lot of negativity. And I feel like um, as the pandemic starts to ease out, we're going to have a huge period of reflection where we're like, okay, like we only focus on COVID at the beginning, but now like, what are these effects? What are the after effects, especially like on kids? You know, a lot of children were born during the pandemic and not used to seeing people's faces. Like, you know, so there's there's going to be this whole psychological shift um, post pandemic where we have to start getting used to seeing each other's faces again, interacting with each other. You know, so as much as there's a lot of positive things that came out of it, it's a lot of negative as well. So that's my experience. It was even more isolating, right? Uh, Rianne, Dakota, anyone? I think that one of the things that I noticed uh, for myself, uh, you know, my self care regimen, like I used to love to go to the gym, uh, that was me, like my me time, um, that was taken away uh, during this time, uh, you know, I found that I just having my space at home. Um, a lot of people got to work from home. Uh, the only time I got to work from home was uh, when we had like a, a COVID case at my children's school and we had to isolate that kind of thing. Um, so all of us would be stuck at home. Um, and so I felt like it was hard to manage work versus home. Um, and so, you know, you'd you'd be working from home, but you'd go over your eight hours a day, you'd, you'd work a little bit more, um, you felt like you had to answer everything because everything felt so urgent. Um, so I think that setting resetting those boundaries now um, is something that is going to be the next, uh, you know, the next uh, stage, because I know a lot of our students that have uh, been able to work from home and do online schooling at this time, when it comes to practicum, uh, they're having a lot of anxiety going out to an actual physical space. Um, you know, now the conversation of is vaccines mandatory or is vaccines, uh, you know, an option for students that maybe have some uh, objection to vaccinations. Um, now their host placement or their future employer in some fields are requiring the vaccine. So it's creating a whole bunch of new conversations. Um, but I'm just glad that the conversations are happening. Right. Um, I found when COVID first started, um, I found that it was less conversations and more people dictating at each other. Uh, you know, like um, in my community, there were people taking pictures of runners um, that came too close to them on the sidewalk and anyone like and they'd be like, does anyone know this person? They were running too close to me. It's like this is not humanity, people, you know, like so I think that um, we kind of went completely the other way during the panic of COVID and now we're starting to have those conversations and people starting to go, you know what, I made it through COVID. Now what can I do to improve my life so that I don't have to go through this type of stress or anxiety or depression again? How can I reconnect with families um, and friends, right? Or create the groups that I didn't have before. So I think that it's, it's a fresh start for a lot of people. And, uh, you know, for some, it's very scary. It's very scary, you know, to start going through the work of creating new friendships because we all want that friendship that's like 20 years old and so comfortable right um yeah. but how do we start again right absolutely i think um a lot of the fear when people are reacting out of that fear space because there was a pandemic um you know 
people in my neighborhood started yelling at kids for riding their bikes and kids need to, to go out. Like they cannot afford to stay at home. Um, so I think that we can become more resilient and tolerant as a society now with, with the hope that's coming in and listen to other viewpoints of people who don't want to get vaccinated and have a conversation about it with compassion. Yes, Dakota. Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, obviously there were oh, just working at a crisis center just to see the change, uh, like statistics wise, we saw like suicide contacts increased by 70% throughout the span of, of the pandemic. So I think through the pandemic, we saw obviously a ton of isolation, a ton of folks, especially I think, Adele, I think you had brought up the, the piece of addiction and, and folks using substances more, um, which can increase the risk of, of um, suicide rate. Folks are, are more at risk of suicide if they're intoxicated on substances. So those are definitely things we noticed in, in the contact center. I, I personally feel like we have not even seen the impacts of COVID yet, mental health speaking. Um, I think that, you know, we are just getting into the part where we can start looking at the aftermath effects of the last, what, 15, 16 months, right? Um, how that's going to be impacting, you know, children who weren't in schools, how that's going to be impacting kids who, you know, didn't really have access to the things that they needed to do that online schooling or, you know, the parenting that they needed to be successful in that online schooling. So I think there's many things that we, we don't even know are going to be impacted yet because right. we're still so fresh into this. Um, I think we will still continue to see suicide, suicide um, contacts rise. And, and I hope I'm not coming off as morbid in saying that, but just hopefully yeah. it's realistic because um, there's just so many things, right? So many people lost their jobs and, and it doesn't immediately mean that they're just going to, to be able to go back to work, right? We know that the economy is going to struggle for, for a couple of years at least. So I, I honestly have a lot of concerns for the community, especially, you know, I think we should continue the conversation of, of yes, things are opening back up and, and things are starting, you know, to, to be more positive, but we also need to recognize like, you know, we all, we all just lived through trauma for the last year and a half, right? We all were literally fearing for our lives for the last year and a half. Um, and that's something that's going to affect us long-term, all of us, right? Regardless of, of where we are in society, this is going to have an impact on us um, in the long run. So I think just being open to having those conversations and, and understanding that just because the pandemic is over um, doesn't mean that we still don't need those mental health supports or we're still not feeling those residual impacts of, of the last you know, 15, 16 months of, of trauma. Absolutely. I think that's a big part of mental health education um, in setting our expectations that when an event ends, uh, we don't just switch back to normal and are completely functioning. You know, we have to deal with that emotionally, psychology, physically. Um, uh, so yeah, setting our expectations realistically about mental health is a big part of, men of the solution. So let's dive into solutions. Yeah, I think that the one big one is, uh, you know, it's not just up to the person that needs help uh, to reach out for help. I know that um, there's a lot of guidelines. Um, so for example, with teenagers, uh, teenagers, if they do come to a psychologist, um, the psychologist will have to engage the parents. But if they go to a social worker, the social worker can deem that the child is uh, mature enough to handle their own um, you know, uh, mental health, right? So uh, there's different, uh, you know, under different colleges and different registrations, um, there's different guidelines. So if you do get a no one time, it doesn't mean that it's your no uh, forever. Um, I know I, I had to reach out to a doctor of my friends um, because my friend, uh, even though for religious beliefs, they would never commit suicide, um, I knew that they were clinically depressed um, and they were aware that they were clinically depressed. However, because they weren't at risk of suicide, they weren't going to do anything for it, um, which is, is very a sad way to live, right? Um, is, you know, uh, because suicide at the end of the day is a means of escape. 
So these people aren't necessarily wanting to die. They're not wanting to hurt anybody. I know the stigma is that it's a selfish thing to do. You should think about everybody else. Um, however, this is a pain. This is like having a bullet wound that's not being uh, addressed, right? So how do we get everybody the help that they need? Um, and you know, if you're wrong and you engage someone and you raise the alarms, what's the harm, right? Uh, that person just knows that it comes from a place of caring. Um, and as long as we're we're being true to ourselves as to why we're we're looking for help for someone, um, you know, not trying to say fix them because I in relationships this happens a lot where people come into couples counseling and they're like, here's my husband, fix them, right? And that's not what we want. Um, everybody is a dynamic like everyone is relating with each other um you know for example uh some of my favorite clients were schizophrenic um and they gave me such an eye opening um into the different cultures so i uh, you know in our culture schizophrenia is considered a very negative context because a lot of it is um you know some pretty scary uh you know uh like voices that they have and and some pretty scary uh it's not as positive of a symptom um if you go to other countries they're considered like enlightened they're uh you know sometimes the one that people go to for advice because they can see other planes and that kind of stuff right so where we uh here have a stigma about schizophrenia other cultures embrace them so they don't have to be medicated, right? Um, and so how do we do that? Uh, here, the medication, sometimes people don't understand when you, you quiet those bad voices, you're actually taking away some of the good voices too. So, um, you know, some of their greatest supports and some of their greatest loving friendships are actually in those voices also. So we have to be careful. How do we replace that? How do we make people not feel isolated in any diagnosis? I mean, borderline personality disorder, a lot of people don't understand that that's a seven year diagnosis. I've talked to so many people that have been diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. And I say to them, okay, what traits do you have that got you the diagnosis? They said, I don't know I went to the hospital one night um, it was my third suicide attempt so they told me I have borderline personality disorder and that was it um, so you know they were given some contact numbers but they weren't told what their symptoms were why they're being uh, you know uh, diagnosed with this lack of diagnosis is really what it is because there's normal I uh, you know uh, mentally normal uh, you know, uh, symptoms, and then there's abnormal uh, symptoms. And borderline means that they couldn't figure out why sometimes you're you're flipping in the normal, and sometimes you're flipping in abnormal, and it can happen within minutes. Um, so really, it's a lack of diagnosis because DSM-5 had to put something in there, right? Um, so we have to realize that as humans, we're evolving, our brains are evolving. And so what we are as humans is evolving and what's considered a mental illness now um, could be considered normal in the future which is if we look at past uh you know in, in the past there were lots of things that were considered a mental illness in the past that are now actually being human and if we look back centuries ago it was considered human back then too so it's all about the definition by society so as society we can contribute to new definitions wow that's deep. <laughs> I totally agree with you on that as well. Like, I think that um, it's hard to say that there's no, there's, I can't really say there's a solution because uh, there's always like, there's, since it's such a big, like such a big issue and so broad, um, there's, I think there's no one way. Um, but I feel like uh, it's all about just kind of creating understanding and creating dialogue um, and also like breaking down stigmas um, and, and also empowering the voices of people that are from those types of communities. Because, you know, even though we, like I can say like mental health and psychology is one of those like um, fields of studies that we still don't know a lot about. We still don't know like, a lot about how the brain works or how the brain functions or how certain events or traumas or experiences, like what are the long-term adverse effects of said things, you know? So I feel like we're all learning and the thing when we kind of come to that acceptance where we can say, maybe we don't know, maybe we can learn from those people who are struggling because I feel that um, experience is the greatest teacher as well. And then you go and study, you know, cause theory versus practice, right? 
Um, so you can have the practice of having those experiences and then going and also learning the theories behind it. And I feel like uh, education, conversation, and empowerment are all the solutions because when you create understanding and you're able to build dialogue, um, you're able to then, um, you know, create that understanding. And when you understand, then you're able to, to empathize because I think the issue is we think that we're leading with sympathy, but sympathy is like, you know, in a way you put yourself above someone by like, oh, I'm sorry, you blah, blah, blah. But empathy is okay. Like you are able to connect with that experience and say, oh, I, I understand. Um, maybe I might not fully grasp it, but um, let me learn from you. Then, you know, and that's empathy. And you empower them to find their own solutions, be their own foundation and realize that like, you know, um, once they are able to help themselves, you know, then you're, you're they're able to move forward in the world. Cause even lifeguards, right. If someone's drowning in a pool, uh, the rule is if someone's flapping, flapping and you don't, you're not supposed to jump in, you got to let them calm down first, you know, and then you say, okay, I'm going to help you, but you have to also be willing to help yourself to so take a deep breath, relax, and let's work together to save to save you you know and that's kind of how i look at mental health i look at it like if someone's in a pool drowning do i jump in and drown with them or do i wait for them to calm down we have that conversation to say okay i'm coming in now relax i'm gonna throw this i'm gonna throw you this okay i'm gonna throw you this information i'm gonna throw you um like these resources and it's up to you to grab it and to and up to you to take those necessary steps um to find the solutions you know for yourself but there are um resources and communities that you can turn to, but you have to be wanted. You have to want that. And I feel like that's what I'm learning from a lot of the work when I'm, uh, cause I'm uh, speaking with a lot of women who were child soldiers and stuff. So when I look at their experiences, it's like, I wanna lead with empathy and lead with understanding and say like, you know, I have something to learn from your experience because I don't know what that experience was like for you. Um, and then I'm able to then, you know, look at my own experiences and be able to create a relationship and so that next time, if I find someone who's gone through those types of experiences, I know how to lead, you know? Um, and so I think that the solution is around understanding, empathy, um, and conversations. So, yeah. Oh, that's fascinating. Um, so I think that a lot of the solutions that we've talked about are community, um, empathy, tolerance, and understanding that we're all connected and we're not on our own and everyone has to help themselves and keep their um, problems hidden. We're, we're all about sharing and learning. What were you gonna say, Dakota? Yeah, I think really just, I, I agree with, with what uh, both Rian and, and Adele have said, right? Especially, you know, I think one thing I have really taken away from, from working at Distress Center is, you know, listen to hear, don't listen to solve, right? I think a lot of the times we, we listen to be like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to hear your story and I'm going to think of this, this, and this that I can give to as resources. And sometimes the resource that they need is just someone to hear them out and someone to, to empower them to do what they need to do in their life to either, you know, succeed in whatever they want to succeed in or to get better with their mental health. Because at the end of the day, I, I think with anyone, right, there's nothing that I'm going to say to someone that is just going to be like, snap, okay, everything, my mental health is good, right? It has to be within that person, within themselves and what they do. Um, so rather than listening to to solve and, and listening to figure out what we can do to solve, rather just listen to, to allow others to be heard, uh, listen without judgment, listen um, so that they have the space to talk about things that they wouldn't be able to talk about with other people. Um, and that's really what we do. That's what we're all about at Distress Center is, you know, you can call us to have the conversations that you can't have with family and friends, right? That's why crisis lines exist, because sometimes you just need an unbiased, anonymous person that you can talk to about the crappy things in life. Um, and I, I think what I commonly see in new volunteers is that that immediate response to try and solve and be like, well, there's this resource and this one. Um, and yes, of course, those resources are needed, but until that person is in a space where they're willing to accept that help and to, to do, you know, whatever homework they need to, they just need to be heard, right? Um, yeah. And I, I think the other thing to really understand with solution is the amount that 
would help if people just had their basic needs met, if housing was more affordable, if food was more affordable. Um, you know, I would say a majority of suicide contacts I hear, the main reason is because their basic needs aren't being met. And, and why the heck is that still happening, right? Even, yeah. um, you know, thinking of, you know, Indigenous communities, they don't even have clean water. Like, this is unbelievable in Canada, and we need to make changes immediately. Yes. And so in that situation, not having good mental health is a normal response to the situation. Yeah. Wow. Okay, so let's just end it off with um, telling people how to seek professional help if they need to. What exactly does it look like? Because at the end of the day, uh, I'm not a professional uh, and sometimes it's not enough for someone like me to listen to them, even though it might help. Um, what would that look like to be able to seek professional help? Where would they go? Uh, what would happen? Yeah, so I think there's there's quite a few different ways that you can access mental health in Alberta. So one of the ways I will always say uh, distress center houses 211 Alberta, so Southern Alberta. So 211 is a resource line. Um, the thing with that is it can get quite overwhelming for folks because it's quite a lot of pinballing, which basically means they give you a list of numbers and you yourself as that person has to call all those resources, which can be quite inaccessible for someone who is you know, experiencing a lot of anxiety or, or mental health concern, right? So I think the first thing would be to reach out to a crisis line or a resource line. Um, and then a, a next step would be talking to a trusted doctor or health professional, right? And seeing what's available in your community. Um, and yeah, I think just reaching out to anyone in your, in your support system that you're comfortable, whether you need someone to go with you, right? Um, I know lots of folks will have someone go with them to their first AA meeting um, or things like that. So I think it can look it can look quite different whether you need support or whether that person is just wanting to reach out individually. I think the the most important thing is consent, right? So if you're someone who's concerned for another person, just to understand that that person you're worried about has to be consenting to get that help, um, or it's just not going to work, right? We have to give a gentle gentle nudges to get that support, um, not just forcing them into it. Because, yeah, forcing someone into support is, is A, the system's not going to fly with it. It's pretty hard to get support without consent. Um, and it's, it's, yeah, it's let's empower other people to reach out. Yes, we all have tools hidden within us. Um, I think that um, finding ways to uh, kind of like promote for me, I think that there's different ways that you can seek help. Um, but I think it starts within yourself. So um, if there's, I think you can start by journaling, you know, and just being able to connect with yourself and be like, okay, like, what am I feeling? What am I experiencing? You know, if you're not ready to take that step and um, reach out to, to someone, reach out to yourself and find a private mm -hmm. book and just write into it. And, and as you practice getting familiar with your emotions, it, you might then have enough courage to go and ask for help. Um, and then also as a, as somebody who might be seeing that someone's having a, a, an experience, I think that just be there, be a supportive, you know, instead of trying to change someone or trying to, uh, sympathize with them, just be supportive. What do you need? Call me anytime. Like just be there as a support system for them. And that's going to give them the courage to be like, okay, maybe I should seek some help, you know? Um, and we and let them understand that there's no stigma around it. It's okay to have, to be not okay. You know, um, we have this culture of hustling and having to think we always need to be at our best and that's not necessary. Um, so just take the time to be within yourself first. And then once you have the courage within yourself, you know, you gotta, you can reach out um, and then you can also end up maybe becoming a voice um, to help other people. So it's just kind of that relay race of, um, you know, yeah. So don't be afraid to just start inside of yourself and then go outwards, you know, um, that's my piece of advice. I love that. That's such an accessible thing for most of us, just to reach out to ourselves first, check in with ourselves. I think that uh, Dakota kind of touched on this, but um, I think that people sometimes uh, don't realize the symptoms that are showing um, that 
people don't identify as mental health. For example, uh, financial concerns can create mental health problems, but they can also be a symptom of a mental health problem, right? So uh, people sometimes uh, go on a shopping spree and that creates these good feelings and, and these good chemicals in our brains. Um, and so sometimes uh, that could be solved uh, by us just having those good feelings coming from something else like more connected relationships um you know i know myself uh i was i joined a uh group that was um kind of like a, a self-reflection book club uh so we never have time to read books so we did like an audio book um and then we would just meet for wine every every month and uh you know and so it forced me to get through these books so I, uh, you know, it was it was great because I got to experiment with Brene Brown and and some of the the great insights um, while walking. So you know, combining uh, a book club with a walk or um, you know something something else that you can do just to relax and kind of feed the body, feed the mind at the same time. And I can tell you, I am the worst uh, for self care. I am really bad about it. Um, so, you know, it, it's been something, cause I've always thought of it as being selfish and it's not selfish because as a person, when you look at it, if something was to happen to you, how many people in your life it affects, um, you know, you're really helping out your family and your friends by maintaining your own health. So that includes mental health and physical health. Um, but if you are having, um, you know, financial issues or anything like that, uh, check your mental health and see if maybe it's a pattern, right? Maybe it's a dysfunctional relationship where you're trying to spend before your, your spouse can spend. You know, maybe it's a symptom of an abusive relationship. You never know, right? Um, and so I think that that's something that we always need to, to look at. Um, you know, it could be as simple as you stayed at a low paying job because you haven't had the confidence to move on so everything is is mental health and uh you know your your mental health is your superpower so uh if you can control your mind it's kind of the difference uh between the karate kid going slow and uh you know the matrix where you can download to the end right and just download it into your brain um we all want the matrix but really we've got to start with the karate kid right so it's little every day yeah in every moment. Well, guys, I think with that, we've hit the end of our panel. So I want to respect everybody's time. Thank you so, so, so much. We, I, I really enjoyed this and I'm sure our audience will as well. Um, if you guys want to just quickly uh, either talk about your projects that you're working on right now or give your socials, if, if that's something that you want to do, this is the time to do it. Okay, well, you can find me on Instagram. My name is ADHL Adila Ro. Um, yeah. And currently, I'm in the I'm in the process of um, creating a docu series. Um, it's called The First Girls. So it's looking at uh, the first set of female child soldiers to join the liberation movement in South Sudan. Um, we've identified a few of the women, and we're starting to put the story together. Um, I'm just pitching to networks right now. Um, so. It's pretty, I'm pretty close, um, but yeah, I'm really excited. This is gonna be a really, um, a very like new experience for me because initially I just started with a short film um, and now my production company has just been incorporated. So we are uh, about to like take full effect in the next couple of months here. Um, so I'm just really excited to be able to like bring more, bring a creative platform for um, people to share their experiences and to also educate the world about um, it, how even though trauma can be can be like create PTSD and all these kinds of stuff, you can also move past it. And that there's also can be a silver lining at the end. Um, so I just kind of want to, to relate people's experiences and also be able to show that not all stories of war are about sadness, but there's also triumph. Um, and that relationship of sisterhood and you know connection is really important. Um, so hopefully we can build more community around these types of conversations, but that's me, Adela Rope. Yeah. Thanks, Adele. That's going to be a fascinating film. Okay, guys. Well, CDI College is going to do a mental health campaign where we, on social media, where we share 
stories of our personal mental health journey. So look out for that. And thank you all so much for coming. Thank you so much. Take care, everyone. Thanks for having us. Bye. Bye, guys. Have a great week. You too. Bye.